Come on, man. All right. Did, will you guys all like wave to the camera? I'm going to put you guys on the startup. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, cool. How you guys doing? Hey, how are you? Doing pretty well. Friday is nice and it finally feels like fall weather so we can like kind of pull out, put on the coats and like I feel like that's when like we can get the most creative with like fashion. You know what I mean? Anyone else like cardigans, that kind of thing? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, cool. Um, well, I'm, my, my story kind of starts out a little dark, so I apologize. It's early in the morning, but um, I was uh, in, I was just kind of to show you guys the origin story, how I got introduced to entrepreneurship and and kind of what kept me going, right? Um, but when I was a young kid at the age of seven, um, I was sexually abused. And, you know, if, whether some of you in this room, you can relate to that or you know someone, um, that is a very, you know, traumatic experience for someone, especially being so young where the, the cognitive brain developments in my brain are very malleable, right? So having something so tragic to me can, you know, at that age, I'm mean, really any age, but especially at that age can really uh, significantly impact me. So, you know, come middle school, I was already like smoking cigarettes i was running um excuse me i was running away from home i was you know i was starting to experience i was starting to like mature very quickly and starting to develop like a, a sense of like my anxieties my insecurities my depression is what i was starting to develop i had not realized it was depression at that point just because i was just so young but i was developing this deep depression and ultimately what was happening was i was just super lonely like I was lonely in my experiences and I really didn't feel like I could, you know, really relate to a lot of people. And in elementary school, I switched from uh, public schools to private schools. So the few friends that I had, you know, lost them, had a new school and just dealing with all these things, just the world is very confusing to me. Um, come, come seventh grade, like, like I mentioned, um, you know, I was getting in middle school, I was kicked out of school, you know, just for doing just, just being stupid. I mean, all these different things, getting in trouble in class, just not, you know, giving crap out of authority. Um, but at the end of the day, I was just confused and I was just kind of lacking um, this kind of belonging on this earth. Um, come freshman year of high school, things, you know, th things weren't getting any better. Um, I started hanging around, a, you know, bad crowd, you know, worse crowd. And you know, ultimately, like, my feeling of alienness, you know, I have a alien tattoo that I'm going to talk about the meaning here in a bit, but like my, my alienness or my loneliness really just made me want to feel like I belong somewhere or like I had friends. And so I wanted to just fit in or feel normal. So in early high school, you know, freshman year, I started drinking, um, partying, you know, testing different drugs, trying to like the, feel this void that was inside of me. Right. I mean, there's this like deep emptiness inside of me. There's this, this lacking of something. And I was trying to fill it with all these like substances or partying or, you know, sex, you know, whatever I could do to, that the world was telling me like, hey, this makes you happy. Hey, this will make you feel fulfilled and good. What was happening was the Monday after a weekend of partying, even though don't get me wrong, the parties were great. But the Monday after the weekend of partying, I was worse off than I was before because there's still something lacking. And what was happening was um, I lacked purpose. I just I just didn't feel like I, you know, I mattered. I didn't feel like my existence had significance. And so um, unfortunately things kept getting worse and, and again, I'm just going to be full transparent with you guys. I'm actually recent over the last year. I'm getting more open about these things. So I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, by the way, I really appreciate you guys having me here and listening. Um, but so come summer before sophomore year, um, things weren't looking out for me. You know, things weren't looking better for me. The, the light at the end of the tunnel that I was either being, being told from parents, therapists, friends, whatever was starting to get super small. And I, couldn't really see it. And, you know, like I mentioned, I was trying all these drugs and all these solutions to try to fix me or whatever. And these weren't fixing me. So I was like, well, maybe there's a more permanent solution. Um, I started to like cut myself because what was happening was I felt that I was a burden on other people's lives. Like I felt that like I was this overwhelming like burden. I was, you know, everyone had to look out for me or like we had to make sure there wasn't knives around me at the house and just stuff like that. And I, these thoughts just really clogged my brain. And so um, long story short, I tried to take a more permanent solution and tried to uh, take my own life, um, fill my hands with uh, pills from my medicine cabinet and just threw everything I could down there and choked myself. It was so many plastic pellets in my throat. Um, well, I believe by the grace of God or the universe, or, you know, whatever, you know, some kind of higher deity that I was, I survived, that I was saved, that there was some kind of purpose. And so um, at that time, I had a mentor who he was an entrepreneur himself. And while I had no idea what that word meant, I had no idea what entrepreneurship even was, 
I had a, uh, but before I had a therapist who understood psychology and understood the, so the brain. And so her kind of, you know, after I had this traumatic experience, you know, trying to off myself and all these kind of things, her solution was not, here's just another pill was not, here's this new remedy that, you know, all this new study it was, what does the brain tell us about what makes humans happy? You know, there's a chemical called serotonin in your brain. You might've heard of it. You regulate your mood, anxiety, your happiness. And so long story short, scientists theorize you can trigger this chemical this happiness chemical by doing stuff for other people. You know, if you guys think about, you know, one time when you held the door for someone or a kid dropped his books or you encourage one of your friends when they're in a breakup or something and they let you know that like they appreciated you and they like loved you and that, that you mattered to them, you felt good inside. That wasn't some like random phenomena, some random feeling that was serotonin being released in your brain. So long story short, after trying to take my own life, I just, you know, through, through the help of my therapist and parents, I just started, serving see when i was depressed the questions i would ask my brain were how can i help myself like how can i make myself happier what can i do for me but you guys can't really blame me and you can't really blame depressed people when those those are questions they're trying to figure out because they hate themselves or they hate the world that they're living in right so they're they're trying to just get through the day but when per the help of my mentors and therapists when i flipped the script and said how can i help someone else how can i make someone else smile when I could see someone else smile by my words and my actions, it in turn made me feel more fulfilled and alive than literally any party, any, anything that, that I had tried before. Like it was sustained level of happiness. It was joy. It was fulfillment and it was just different. And so going back to my mentor who was an entrepreneur, when I looked at his life and analyzed his family and, and what people said about him, he, they were often helping other people and serving other people. And they lived a, lived a rich life, not just monetarily, um, he did have a few cool cars, but they lived a rich life like as a whole, like, like they were well off and, you know, they're helping other people that a great legacy in the city. And so that kind of like inspired me to research what is this entrepreneurship business thing. And long story short, through my research, I had found that entrepreneurship at its core is serving others. Whether you're an entrepreneur at, an, at a company or an entrepreneur starting your own company, you are solving problems for other people creating conveniences, making other people's lives better, teaching people things, making people feel better, whatever that product might be, whatever the, the end result might be, you are impacting other people in some way. And so I wanted to kind of test the idea of entrepreneurship. Like I, you know, serving people was therapeutic to me. And, you know, as I mentioned, and I want to do it for the rest of my life and I have big ambitions, big goals, and I want to impact lots of people. And so entrepreneurship just kind of made sense, but I ultimately just didn't know. So I wanted to test it out and try it. I was a skateboarder at the time and honestly still am. And so I started a skateboard manufacturing company called Void Longboards. If you remember back to my story about filling the void and uh, that was kind of my introduction to entrepreneurship. You know, to be honest with you, I actually lost almost $7,000 in that company, all my own money working at Chick-fil-A and mowing lawns and flipping skateboards. Uh, but although the business closed with the deficit, I was drawn to entrepreneurship because how much it impacted my life and how much I could see an impact on others, how much I saw that I could grow and how much I saw that I could help others grow. And so um, even though the business closed, per the help of mentors, um, I was able to see past that, A, realize every single su successful person, successful however you might define, they have some failed project or some failed business before. Um, so it's very normal. And if you're failing, you're on the right track. And then B, at the end of the day, failures are just an opportunity to learn. So that was kind of my introduction to entrepreneurship and serving others. And, and at the end of the day, I, I, you know, I just keep going and just keep building things, being a part of things because I feel like my purpose is serving others and, and I get rewarded by the universe when I can you know, help, I can make an impact on people. Hey, Jeremy, that's great. Um, and one of the key things that we actually start with or have talked about a lot here in class is the power of story and mm. why to know how to tell your own story we're actually like trying to create the story of this class. How do we brand this class? And mm. What's the story other people are going yeah. to tell in this class, yeah. right? So we really appreciate that. We also totally connect with your um, your story because you're speaking about purpose, right? Mm. Purpose-based living is not just about what is significant to you. It's mm. about what can affect the larger community. True. About that, really appreciate the the vulnerability and the connection that you're making with us. Thank you. But yeah, so okay, so great question, storytelling. Um, so, are, are any of you guys familiar with Simon Sinek? Yeah, one person is okay. You're awesome. You're amazing. Whoever said yes. So Simon Sinek is a big role model. He's a great marketer, speaker. Um, he wrote a book called Start with Why, 
And so long story short, I, I, I had a marketing company at one time and then also worked for a marketing company. So from the CMO of GoDaddy, Fortune 500 companies, all the way down to the local realtor in a small town of Indiana, there's something called a why video that every single person should make. See, Simon Sinek talks about something called the golden circle, right? Why, what, how. Every single person might know what you do, okay? They might know how you do it, maybe how you're different, maybe how you view things differently, but very few people know why you do what you do. Like, what is the inner core purpose, the inner motivations of why you get up each day in the morning, why you make the sacrifices that you, know, that you do? What's that, you know, kind of how I mentioned that, how I was depressed and entrepreneurship was this, you know, therapeutic experience to me, then I built a company around that. Like, that origin story, that why, makes people understand why you do what you do. At the end of the day, in branding, storytelling, um, and marketing, we're trying to build trust through you know, a relationship, right? You know, it's, it's ultimately about relationships, but you wanna build trust in that relationship so that your words hold weight and that people remember what you say. And, and you really, if you wanna go deeper, at the end of the day, our goal is word of mouth marketing. And so we wanna be able to give people something to talk about. And in society, in, in today's day and age, and honestly, if you go back to even 2,000, 3,000 years ago when people got around campfires, storytelling is like, you know, we are a storytelling species. You know, we go through life, we go through social media, looking at it as a buffet, and we're looking for the stories. We're looking for the things that we connect with most. We're looking for the things that we feel this emotional connection. And like, okay, when I was 12 years old, my dad or, or my mom taught me this thing, or I had this experience with this person and so that I connect with that in some way, you know, whatever it might be. So for you guys, for your individual personal brands, for each of your companies or businesses that you're a part of or for your class, make why videos. And if you want to go to, so a, a little bit about me, I went to work at a company called Blitzmetrics. Um, they ran the advertising, advertising for the Golden State Warriors, um, Nike. And so I had a privilege to learn a lot of amazing things there, but they, that, and that company is called Blitzmetrics. They have a landing page called blitzmetrics.com slash why. And I can shoot you that link, um, Garrett, but it's blitzmetrics.com slash why. And it's basically a full explanation. You know, there's uh, video tutorials. There's what a why video is. There's actually the head of personal branding at uh, GoDaddy. He's teaching this little two-minute video on what a why video is. And it really just hones in on, at the end of the day, a why video is like a 60 to 90 second video where you are defining your purpose. You're defining your passion about why you do what you do. Because at the end of the day, you might have a cool product. You might be a cool person. But, you know, if, you know, like if I want to get into, into the metrics of things, the average watch time on Facebook is six seconds, which is like a fair video consumption metric across the internet. And so if the average watch time is six seconds, and if it takes people, you know, 12 seconds to say, okay, hi. My name is Jeremy Miller. I'm the vice president of marketing at Startup Foundation. We do this. You know, like that stuff just isn't interesting. But if I, if I can start out immediately with a story, when I was 16 years old, I was depressed and then this happened to me and then I was introduced to, to serving others and now I found entrepreneurship. You know, that's, there's just a different level of emotion there. And so in a why video, you can kind of define that story, define your passion. And every single one of you has that purpose. You have that why, you have that amazing passion that amazing story that's going to resonate with someone else. And, that, that, and that's kind of the goal at the end of the day. The, the people seeing your content, whether it's blogs, videos, websites, et cetera, people are resonating with what you're putting out. Therefore, they want to keep watching what you're putting out or talking about what you're doing, which is, you know, that's when things can get exciting. That's when opportunities can just flood your inbox. Awesome question from you guys. How about connections for those of you who went to the innovation festival what are some things that you hear jeremy say that you may have heard and would like some extension okay uh the why aspect uh we listened to the guy uh at his who was from disney and one of his main points was uh don't stop at the first why mm. uh then continue to ask like why people are doing these things. So that's a, that's a good connection. Dude, that's huge. Just the value of asking why or multiple times, just like that guy from Disney, that, that's amazing. Why, why, why? The, the question why it's can just, because it, it drives, just drives for depth, right? I mean, so many times in this day and age, whether it's media or just conversations that, you know, that other people of our age might have, because I'm close to guys' age, I'm 20. Um, a lot of times it's just surface level, right? It's just not super interesting, but when you ask why, like, why do you do what you do? Why is something that way? Why am I doing this? Why does, are people affected in this way? 
you're driving for depth, which is, you know, that's at the end of the day what people remember, and that's at the end of the day what is memorable. Jeremy, could you talk uh, maybe a little bit about some of the companies you've started and also some of the companies you had that failed and how you sure. Absolutely. So, so I mentioned my first company, Void Longboards, failed, lost seven, almost seven, eight thousand dollars. Um, so through that experience, Void was about a year and a half long project, and um, I was reading lots of articles online about marketing and through that social media. This was 2014 at the time, and so I was very intrigued with online branding and with being a physical manufacturing company. And so, long story short, through reading these articles, testing the depths of social media, and trying to get content to go viral, you know, Twitter at the time was a very prominent platform. Um, I had organically reached over 100 million impressions on content. 250,000 followers was getting stuff going viral left and right. It, you know, had a thousand dollar ad with Coachella, like interesting things. This was, I mean, this was while I was doing the skateboard company, but I hadn't really realized that this social media thing could actually be a company in business. So after I failed the skateboard company, I was talking to a mentor of mine. I was like, hey man, by the way, a failing company is not very uh, motivating. So I don't know why I'm here. He, and you know, that's kind of where he helped me realize, you know, failures are just a beautiful opportunity to learn. But he said, Jeremy, what was the one thing that you were good at, at Void? What was the one, if there's one thing that you could repeat successfully, what was that? And for me, that was social media, as I mentioned. So after the skateboard company, I launched a social media marketing company where I managed uh, social media uh, accounts for different brands, mostly Twitter. Um, and then as Facebook and, and then in one Facebook bought Instagram, and, you know, eventually moved in, into those two uh, platforms as well. But purely strictly, it was managing uh, social media platforms, creating content for them, and then posting it. I wanted to feel kind of a deeper impact on companies. So long story short, I met a, uh, you know, there's, there, there are many articles that I was reading on, on, about, online about marketing. There's one guy that I kept consistently reading. His name was Dennis Yu. And the story of how I got connected with him is kind of funny, but essentially this guy, his background is he spent a billion dollars at Yahoo, worked right under the CMO, and now he owns Blitzmetrics, which is that company I worked for. And like I mentioned, you know, clients, Golden State Warriors, you know, just huge brands. And so I uh, basically, right after I, gra so I graduated high school, May 20th, 2017, it was the best day of my life. Um, but three months after graduating high school, I lived with this guy and his team in Tempe, Arizona for a couple months just to be a sponge, just to learn as much as I can. L literally put most of my stuff on hold besides the stuff I could do on my laptop, which for a lot of the social media clients I could still do. But I moved out there, but just learned a ton of stuff about advertising and, and funnels and digital marketing. How can I drive conversions, right? And so, you know, I was having that social marketing company, but after I spent those three months with him, my vision for marketing and digital marketing was possible on the internet. Like, I mean, it was huge. So I came back to Indianapolis and started an advertising company, which was more focused on funnels, Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising, that kind of thing called Inspired Blue Media. And this company is where I'm very thankful and blessed and grateful to say things really took off for me um, financially and my personal brand. Um, getting on the news, Forbes, you know, just some other media things like that. Um, but this is where I really leveraged. You know, I really leveraged the, the company as a platform to meet people, to travel, to develop myself. Um, through Snapshift, we had a client uh, called Snapshift. Um, they were a, a brand new startup in Indianapolis, a food, uh, a gig economy staffing platform for food and beverage operations. So you guys remember with Uber and Lyft, essentially that, but for bartenders, servers, cooks, dishwashers. And at the time, Snapchat was a very small, very small company. They were still getting funding, still building their app. And well, long story short, agency space, being in the agency, running agency can be very stressful. To make more money, you have to have more clients, right? But to have more clients, it's, it can be duplicative, more work. And building out a team was just very stressful and everything. And so long story short, I was looking for a way out of the agency space. Even though I was making good money, my, my pie of life was you know, it was work was just flooding into everything, right? I didn't have life balance. And so I was kind of looking for a way out of the agency space. And um, Snapshift was a very exciting company. There's, I foresee, I foresaw lots of growth forward. And so I had got a co-founder for my agency, then sold my ownership over to him and then joined Snapshift full time as a partner and the director of marketing. Snapshift is now, they've had high user growth throughout the US, mostly based out of Indianapolis, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Nashville. Um, They've actually hence moved headquarters to Silicon Valley just for better funding opportunities. And we were in 500 startups. So very excited for Snapshift. Um, it's doing a, a lot of cool things. I'm, so I'm no longer a part of it, but I'm still a partner. So I'm, you know, I'm in those high level conversations. And of course, if the company sells one day, hopefully I can get a nice check. Um, at January 1st of 2018, I started a nonprofit with Don Wetrick, um, 
And I'm sure you, you, a lot of you might be feeling with called the Start It Up Foundation. And essentially what we do is we empower and equip high school entrepreneurs and innovators um, through events, online programming, um, a business accelerator, statewide pitch competitions, and just some other different programming, different ways that we can spark in, uh, entrepreneurship in young people's minds, develop their actual marketable skills, and help them be executed on the economy. So those are the kind of things I'm working on. And then if you guys are familiar with St. Elmo's Steakhouse, you know, one of the, the most popular restaurant brands in Indiana and the large Midwest. Um, so their parent company, Hughes Culinary, um, I, I'm a brand consultant for them. So I help them share their story, their uh, story and culture through videos on social media. So they own um, St. Elmo's Steakhouse, Harry and Izzy's, Burger Study, and a few other restaurants downtown. So yeah, those are a lot, you know, most of the, my, my ventures. Um, a couple years ago, I started a nonprofit called Project Reach, which is essentially a built uh, sports camps for individuals with special needs. And so th th those are kind of wins, but there's a lot of failed projects in, in between those. I mean, a lot of things were like, I, you know, just like what I said with the Void Longboard Company, I tested it. You know, I, I like to think like scientists like to think, you know, what, how can I have a hypothesis about something, a project, a career, a business, you know, what can I make an educated guess on how I can make this work? But at the end of the day, to be honest, you know, of course I want things to be successful and, and, and to be well, of course. But I mean, really, I view life as a series of stepping stones. And so whether something works or not, I'm going to learn stuff from it. I'm going to meet people and I'm going to be able to take those things that I learn with me for the next thing. Um, you know, I like to say, you know, I was in Madrid, Spain a couple of weeks ago doing a keynote. And I mean, one of the things I left off with, be a student of the world, not only a student of the classroom, right? You know, typically our, our learning styles in the classroom, which there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a, a ton of value from that. But if you think about every single person who you meet on a weekly, daily, monthly, yearly basis, and if you combine that, you know, realization of how many people you're meeting with, every single person in the world can teach you something amazing, can inspire you, can give you a new way of looking at something, right? Perspectives, huge, or can, can introduce you to someone the world becomes your, your sandbox. You, know, you learn so many things. There's a wealth of knowledge, like in, especially with Google and, our, and all of our pockets. There's literally an infinite amount of knowledge and wisdom. And while that can be overwhelming, you know, it can also be very exciting as well with the possibility of you, know, you guys, like the, you guys being in this class and taking action on what you guys are doing with how young you are. Like, there's just so much opportunity, which can just be really exciting. So, Jeremy, uh, one of the things I think some of the kids might be interested in we, the things you have done, you've moved from, you know, like, uh, you know, a starting point and then you've gotten them really high. So I guess, you know, I know Griffin over here is his project. He, one of the projects he wants to do is to create a music festival. Oh, cool. For our area. Right. So how do you go from inception of an idea to building that up? Like, what are some of the key steps? Because I think a lot of kids have ideas but they're wondering, how do I build that idea out? Is there like a pattern or some steps that I can take? And I think you guys might want to take some notes on that because it might be really useful for you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And by the way, Griffin, um, that's a great, dude, that's awesome. I love that you have an idea. And dude, like shout out to you. That's sweet. Um, yeah, so there's, a, of course, a lot of different ways to like start something. There's a lot of different ways to, to take action on an idea. But, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, so, so, to give some background, so on November 9th, uh, my nonprofit, we're throwing a hackathon, right? And which, by the way, all of you guys will be invited. If you guys want information, you know, just just let me know. Um, but we're throwing a hackathon. And to be completely honest, we've never thrown a hackathon. Um, I've never thrown a hackathon. But I just started Googling how to throw a hackathon, checklist to throw a hackathon. What do you need to throw a hackathon? Um, wh what are the ways a hackathon can you know just go wrong? And then I started to think in my life or ask people who I might know, hey, have you ever thrown a hackathon? Um, I'm, you know, I have this goal to throw this event. Can you just give me some pointers? And what I did was I started collecting all this mass, this vast amounts of information. In fact, I literally made a Google doc of just links or just quotes that people told me things from people telling me, Hey, if you're going through a hackathon, look out for this. And then after I held all this information at the end of the day, it was just an, it was basically at that point, just an aggregation of the, that information. And then just planning out the event. I like to think about reverse engineering for when I want to accomplish something, right? So let's say I have a goal for something in six months. What do I need to do four months from now to be where I need to be at six months from now? And then what do I need to have accomplished three months from now to be where I need to be at four months from now or you know, four, four, four months from the event to get to where I need to be six months at, at the event? So like for the hackathon, I had date specific, you know, like four weeks in advance, I needed to have the location figured out. I need to have, you know, all the sponsors figured out. 
two weeks ahead. I need to have all the students, you know, they, you know, committed to the event one week ahead. I need to have all this, you know, the, the supplies and all the different operations. So literally almost by like breaking down what you're actually trying to accomplish because ideas are amazing, but the execution of like, how do we actually accomplish the idea? Who, you know, what people do I need to know in my life? If, if you want to start an app, are you an app developer? No. Well, that's okay. Do you need to know an app developer? Probably. Um, who do you know who has app development experience? Who do you know who might know UX, UI, React Native? Can you start talking with them? Can you share your vision to them and can they get on board with your idea? Um, you know, started up, we've had very blessed opportunities to be able to visit Google, you know, five, six, seven times. And each time we've always asked them different questions. And one question that I've asked almost each time consistently, just because I wanted to hear if each, you know, like we each of those five, six times, there are different offices around the US. I wanted to hear if they had the same answer. But the question was, how does someone like level up on Google? Like how does someone like start entry level and like rise up the ranks or, you know, because a lot of times at Google, you can create your own products and have Google fund it and give you all the resources. You're literally building a business inside of the company. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's owned by Google, but you can still have that like great opportunity. So I was like, how do you get to that point if you're just entry level? And literally consistently, every single time I've gone to Google, they've had the same answer. And essentially around communicating your idea to where people understand it and they get it and they jump on vision, right? So for you, Griffin, what is your vision for this music festival? When you're talking to other mu uh, music, uh, music artists or maybe marketers, you know, your friends who do social media who can maybe help with this event, maybe you have friends who are videographers because of course you're going to want content. Can you share them your vision for this event and is there a way that they might be able to ben benefit, right? If they can get cool content the, of this event and then they can now have a big portfolio and can now showcase their work so that they can get clients, that's mutually beneficial. Both of you win, you know, that's a good marriage. And so by sharing your vision, if other people can jump on it, understand it, see the impact that you're trying to have, but then there's also a way for them to benefit, that's how you can get partners. Because at the end of the day, we want to collaborate. Like, yes, we, you know, as ourselves, you know, we can do great things solo, but if you can get a team, if you can get other people to be a part of it, it's just so much simpler because each and every one of you, you have a unique skill set, a unique perspective, a unique story, a unique your way of looking at something. So when you can combine two of you, maybe three of you on a similar idea and you start to see, okay, we want to throw this event in six months. Well, maybe in three months we need to have just a list of some, you know, our desired set list. If we could have these nine bands or these nine artists, that'd be awesome. Okay. Well then let's just go hit up these nine bands. Hey, would you guys be interested in an event? Four of them said yes, but three of them said no or whatever. Okay, we, we need to go ask some more, you know, some more bands to see if we can hit that number nine. And so just kind of breaking down what are the specific action steps, the specific goals that we need to have accomplished at certain time intervals before we want to have this event or start this company or whatever. So reverse engineering, collaborating with other people, and, you know, communicating that vision so that other people can get it and understand it. And at the end of the day, so much of business is communication, you know, marketing, sales, you know, fundraising. If you're trying to talk to investors, if you're trying to get partners, if you're trying to get sponsors, if you're trying to get people to buy your product or come to your event, it's all about how are you communicating with them? How are you getting them connected on that emotional way? Like, you know, earlier when we were talking about storytelling with social media, same thing, right? You know, what's that story that they can get, you know, that they can get excited about? They're like, okay, I want to come to that event. That's going to be a cool local event supporting local bands and local artists. That sounds cool good community, you know, good energies, all those kind of things, I'm on. You know, how can I help? You know, those are the conversations that, that you would be having with uh, other people. Thank you. Awesome. Very helpful. Others, I have a question. Yo. Um, you said you first got into social media marketing. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Awesome. I started a business a while ago that completely awesome. failed and wasted a ton of money on it and it sucked. But, it does um, suck. Yeah. But I just want to know, how did you start getting clients? How did you first start getting into this thing? Social media marketing? Yeah, uh, great question. You know, and honestly, there's a lot of that. So if you want, um, give your email to, and then I can take it. And like, honestly, like I'll email you. Like, I, like I have a lot of, so long story short, with, our, my, with my marketing agency, we were transitioning to an education agency. So we have Lots of resources, lots of videos on how to start an agency, how to get your first clients, how to have processes. So I will send you all that for free. I will overwhelm you with information, stuff that is I have seen friends, you know, create great agencies. So I'll send you all of that because honestly, there's a lot into that. But I mean, at the end of the day, businesses need what the way you guys view social media, right? All of you guys have social media accounts. You know, you have social media accounts. 
we're personal branding and doing social media marketing already. Like the way we, and in some ways this is where social media can be a negative, but the way we like have this, want to have this reputation on social media and be looking like we're cool and be looking like we're doing interesting things. Businesses and companies have those same kind of goals. The way we don't put in, we, we want to put aesthetic content out that gets the most amount of likes and our friends are engaged by it and they're like, Oh my gosh, it's cool content. Businesses should be thinking like that too. Cause businesses often are thinking about their content should sell, sell, sell. No one wants to be sold on social media. I promise you. I'm in advertising, you know, at, unless it's at the bottom of the funnel and you have just perfectly narrowed your audience, which there's a lot into that. No one wants to be sold on social media. But the way you guys view storytelling and how content can be this tool to create this, this engagement or this relationship on social media, that's what businesses need. So, you know, what I would do if you want to start a social media marketing company, create three packages, you know, create, you know, the, the smallest package and you know, whatever that might be, you know, the most base level and then the third package, your most expensive and make it like you know, full on implementation. You're creating content for them, et cetera. Give them kind of a buffet of options. You maybe you want to kind of tailor it to where they mostly choose the middle one, whatever, but kind of give them a package that explains the value of what you're getting. Cause a lot of times when you're working with businesses, they're thinking they're just paying for your time. Like, Oh, you're going to put 10 hours a week or five hours a week into social media, which might, might be a good way of looking at it. But at the end of the day, the perspective that you're bringing on storytelling and content and how it should resonate with people through videos, et cetera, et cetera. That's what they're really paying for. So if you can, whether looking up, you know, whether the packages that I seen you, which you can totally copy, I would, you know, I would love for you to do that. Or the packages that you're looking, looking up online of how to build a social media marketing package and you're building your package, but expressing that value, then you can kind of get that, you know, those first few clients. And once you get that first one, and you do a good job. The second and third one is so much easier because you can build a testimonial or a case study from that one client validating, giving credibility for what you're doing. Um, some people even, they do like that one or two clients for free, you know, just to kind of, you know, just for a few months, three to six months, whatever, depending on your timeline, everything. So they can get that credibility and then start selling. But, you know, honestly, I, I believe a lot of us are talented enough that we can start charging our prices just by, you know, Googling a lot, watching a lot of videos, HubSpot, et cetera, information that I'll send you. Um, and instantly start monetizing, you know, that skill and talent that you have. Does that kind of help you? Yeah, thank you. Cool. And for real, like if, if you get, give me your email, I will shoot you over videos, information, blogs, all kinds of stuff. Sweet, thank you. You mentioned earlier about how you had like mentors. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you like those? Like how did you approach them? Like Yeah, great question. So. First of all, key, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you, you, you remembered mentors because mentors are so key. Like I, I would never take credit. Like one per, I was on an interview like a couple of days ago and they're like, Oh, you're self-made. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I worked hard, but I'm not self-made. Like mentors are so key. I've leveraged, like I didn't go to college. Like I've learned everything from either doing it on my own or from mentors, right? And mentors have taught me so much. Um, so the answer to your question is whenever I saw someone who was, who I admired, like that was smart or wise, I would just go up to them, whether meeting them on social media or seeing them in person and say, Hey, I have a habit of reaching out or connecting with people who are smarter than wise and who are smarter or wiser than me. Um, what can I do to earn your time? What can I do to earn your trust? Whether it's if you have a social media talent or you have video, uh, video skills or whether you can build events, whatever, here is something, what can I do for you to just earn coffee? And honestly, to be honest with you, if, if an adult hears that they're going to say yes to coffee and just think, cause they're gonna be like, Whoa, I would have never experienced, you know, had thought that a, a high school or, you know, even 18, 19, you know, youth would approach me like that, you know, like that might blow their mind. But even if they like say, oh yeah, sure. Do a, a video project for me, whatever you can to earn their trust. And then whenever I would get that mentor, whenever I would learn something from them, I would always publish it in some way. I would make a video about what I learned from that person, which is, you know, a lot of good personal branding content, but I would highlight them. I would make them feel comfortable. You know, I spent some time with Seth Godin and I'm very thankful for this, but Seth Godin in New York City and one thing that he taught me was every single person in the world wants to increase their status, whether they admit it or not. And they want to increase their status by a variety of different ways into a variety of different audiences. It might be to, they want to make more money. They want to look better. They want to look more uh, like they're giving back more. They want to look like they're, uh, you know, fit, fit or they want to look successful, whatever. And they want to look good for their audience or, you know, like for their social media audience, their friends you know, their colleagues, their family, whoever. And if you can learn what that status indicator is for each person, and if something that, you know, they, that, that you can do to find that mutually beneficial relationship that benefits you and benefits them, like, you know, you can get mentorship, but you can also increase their status. It's a win-win. And so a lot of times adults, mentors, successful entrepreneurs, 
they want to be seen helping the youth. They want to be seen giving back socially, you know, rewarding all these kind of things. So if you, let, let's say you get coffee with someone, which all of you, if you approach them you know, that way, kind of explain, most likely you'll get a coffee or phone call. But if you take a selfie with them or write like a little, little blog or a short little blurb about what they taught you and tag them on social media or let them know, they will feel serotonin will be, will be released in their brain. They will feel so excited about how you made them feel. And then especially if, if then if you start to actually apply what they learn. So, so there's, it's kind of, you know, two, three fold, you know, if you also apply what you learn and actually like took what they said and, and did something with it, you will have an endless supply of mentors. You will have an endless supply of people wanting to help you because you're increasing the, you know, their status. You're helping them win by uh, making them feel good. But you also applying, tells them that you're good soil. When they plant seeds in you, fruit's actually going to be uh, grown from it. Jeremy, we've got short periods today, so they're going to have to go. First of all, good Sweet. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'll send you his Twitter link, all right? So work on those blog posts. I can tweet out about this. Jeremy, if you can just stick around. I Absolutely.